Welcome everyone to our inaugural Astronomy Nights Online. I'm your host, Dr. Ian Shelton, and I'll take care of you for the next 45 minutes. Okay, so the agenda for tonight is we'll do a little bit of news items, then we'll talk a little bit about, about some today about practical astronomy, so what you guys can do to look at the nighttime sky for yourself, and then we'll end off with questions and answers. So in the news, I've got three items up today. I'll talk about SpaceX and more specifically about the Starlink satellites. And then we'll talk about bright comets. There are two comets up in the sky right now. And we'll talk about prospects for you guys actually being able to see these. And then we'll talk about OSIRIS-REx. This is a mission NASA driven for the most part, but Canada is a major player in it. And the uh, nice thing about it is that it's happening right now. And hopefully we'll give you an update if you haven't heard anything about it. So without further ado, let's move on to SpaceX. So in this segment, we're going to talk about Starlink satellites. Starlink satellites, there's uh, Elon Musk. You know him from the electric car fame. Well, he's also uh, the CEO of, and the, the major driver for uh, SpaceX. Okay, And so what SpaceX is doing these days is they're putting up currently uh, large numbers of satellites. These are small, very small mass-produced satellites that they're creating themselves. They're going into low Earth orbit, which is kind of good. And their agenda is what these things, satellites are actually doing is that they're going to be providing internet connectivity for people that normally would never get it. So people like in northern United States and Canada and other parts of the world. So it's a replacement for what would have been the, the satellite phones, the iridium phones that were around, I don't know, sort of maybe still around. But for the most part, it makes it available to everybody at a much more reasonable cost. Okay. That's wonderful. I like that a lot. This is great. Uh, but it comes with some sort of caveats. And so we'll talk about one of the issues that uh, I'll bring up about what these satellites, you know, good or bad are doing. So the issue here is, well, let you look for yourself. So here is a video shot with a, a, a very high sensitivity camera, but for the most part, just a wide angle lens back in November. And you can watch what's happening here. And so for reference, there's a fairly bright planet and a couple of stars off in Sagittarius. And then off in the uh, southwest, we've got coming up this line of lights. You can see a blinking airplane up overhead just to show you that it's you know, happening in somewhat real time. And uh, this line of satellites are, these are these Starlink satellites. So when Elon Musk sets, sends up a rocket, he actually dis disperses 60 satellites at a time. So that's a, we call these a constellation. You know, they're part of a, a full flotilla of these things. So it's neat, it's interesting, it's pretty, uh, but there's a downside to this. Okay, and so the downside is, you know, 60, single line, you know, they're only up in the twilight. That sounds kind of cool. The downside is this. Okay. So this was done about a week and a half ago uh, for my backyard, basically. And that's the full moon. Well, no, that's not the full moon. That is the crescent moon, early moon in the western part of the sky, completely overexposed so I can capture the satellites easily. But if you look over here, of course, you're seeing the rest of the moon because that's Earth shine on it. Just a curiosity if you're wondering about this picture. But these little lines in through here, those are the satellites coming through. And so the field of view, this is, again, the size of the full moon over here. So it's a little line going through the one spot in space. On, on the order of just two minutes, I got 11 satellites going through this one spot in space. Interesting, but if I want to take a pretty picture of the nighttime sky, or if I go camping far away from the aesthetics of the night, you know, of, of uh, you know, light pollution issues here where I live, um, I don't want to see all these satellites going through the view. You know, I, I just like the aesthetics. So for me, yeah, I prefer not to have these. But as a professional astronomer, it's a much more serious issue. So here's a very nice photograph of an, an image, and these are regularly being produced by um, Cerro Tololo four meter telescope in Chile. And this camera, you know, 60 uh, sensors inside it covers about 500 megapixels on the sky, about what three times the size of the full moon, roughly, if I remember right. Um, and then for this, this image, which is pushing down to the limits of detectability, they're in a dark location, one of the darkest places on the face of the earth, all wonderful stuff. And then you have all these white lines going through it. Those are the Starlink satellites going through the field of view, completely obliterating any, any data that would come from objects that are right underneath it. So this is a real problem. Um, so it's been sort of looked into. And so back on in March, the European Southern Observatory, also in Chile, um, came up with a report. They studied this, this you know, what, what do these satellites do in terms of really what are they going to do to our observing and our programs? 
and it's not great. So the bottom line is that uh, for very large telescopes where a lot of the money and effort goes, so for example, the four BLTs, these are four eight meter telescopes uh, in the Atacama Desert in Chile, and the soon to be opened or finished and then opened the very uh, the extremely large telescope ELT, uh, about three or actually four times the size of, of the current largest telescopes in the world, um, it's going to lose about 3% of their exposures are going to be you know, ruined by these satellites coming through the view. Okay, so that's not great. Uh, again, only in the twilight part of the, of the night, so the beginning of the end of the night, but that's still, you know, if you're trying to get on with life, 3% loss is not great. Um, but the real problem is for these wide field telescopes that are coming online, huge telescopes, but designed to basically, you know, generate um, huge amounts of data, so many terabytes of data every single night. What they're doing is they're mapping out the whole sky uh, every single week. They go through the whole sky looking for anything that varies down to the faintest levels to get a real sense of, of what's out there. And so we haven't done this. We haven't had the ability to do this until recently with technology advancing forward. We're ready to go. A lot of money spent in this project. And now because of these satellites coming through, the estimates are between 30 and 50 percent of the exposures at least in the twilight part, but actually you know, deeper into the night, could in fact be affected. So that is a huge uh, setback to this project. And so um, Elon Musk, for what it's worth, we've had dialogue, you know, he's immediately said that he would uh, be sensitive to the needs of you know, astronomers and that, uh, that he would make every effort so that these satellites would not be an issue. And well, they are getting darker. So here's a, um, I can show you some examples a little bit later, but the bottom line is that um, it's a mixed sort of feeling that I've got about these. You know, yes, they're aesthetically kind of neat and they sort of show us that uh, what we are capable of doing, but it's sort of like putting, I, I don't want to throw anything up, but like putting a fast food restaurant in the middle of the, of, uh, the Grand Canyon. Um, it's not maybe the best thing to be doing. There has to be some negotiations to, to work it out, and, and we are. So i uh, love to hear your opinions on this during the question and answer period, a little bit later in this broadcast. Okay, so let's just move on, come back to maybe this later. Okay, um, happier news, I would have hoped, but I'll tell you what I mean in a moment. Um, Comet Atlas, so 2019 YA4, that's when it was discovered last year. Uh, prospects were that it would be one of the brightest comets in the last decade, possibly you know, the comet of the century, like Hale-Bopp was last century. Um, wonderful, except that, um, well, here's a beautiful series of images from a, a whole night of observing from uh, David Wing, excellent astrophotographer uh, live here in Richmond Hill. Um, it's really kind of neat. You can see it moving. The field of view is about a little bit smaller than the size of the full moon, so it's not moving very far uh, each night, but it's moving and you can see a little bit of a tail. This is where when it should have been brightening, constantly getting brighter and more visible. Here's a picture just taken about a week later and you know, so you can see a bit of color but already there's a problem happening. By early April, people are realizing that there's a problem with the comet. It wasn't brightening. It was actually getting a bit fuzzy. And just a few days later with better imaging, but just waiting, the re what was happening was, was revealed. The comet is in fact disintegrating. It's not just sort of fizzling out, it's falling apart. So as you, you know, might imagine something like a snowball uh, coming from the edges of the solar system, maybe for the very first time in its four and a half billion year existence since the solar system formed. It heats up by the sun, that's what makes its coma, and then its tail starts to get pushed back by the solar wind. Well, that heating actually causes lots of stress on this giant snowball, and so suddenly it just starts to fragment and fall apart. Here's a Hubble Space Telescope image taken about, you know, two weeks after that previous one, and you can see 25 fragments all that used to be a single body now falling apart, okay? Uh, three days later, there were only 20. So it's evaporating quickly. So is Comet Atlas going to, it's just right about now that it should be at its peak in the morning sky. Is it going to be there? Well, it's not going to be very exciting. So Comet Atlas is sort of a, a fizzled and dud, but that's sort of, you know, uh, I guess the normal aspects about comets is that, you know, you don't know for sure until you actually watch them, what they're actually going to do. And sometimes they are spectacular and often they're not. But at the same time that Comet Atlas was sort of coming to its end and, and falling apart, uh, another comet was discovered back last month. Really, really neat. Um, it's Comet Swan. And Comet Swan is maybe even prettier. So uh, it reminds me of Comet Hayekataki from 1996, which went on to becoming one of the most beautiful comets I've ever seen and a lot of people have ever seen. Uh, it became a 20 degree tail, visible naked eye, you know, just spectacular, slowly moving in the dark sky. 
So hopes were that Comet Swan would do the same. It was brightening very quickly. That was, it was you know interesting thing about it. I love this picture. It was taken uh, about two weeks ago by um, Damien Peach. Damien Peach is an excellent astrophotographer. You've probably seen lots of his work. Um, done with a not normal but a 200 millimeter camera lens anybody can get that it's a fast one f2 so you need a little bit more money for this kind of a lens but in a dark location it looks beautiful spectacular the length of that tail it's you know, several degrees probably the order of, of four or five degrees long for that's like eight times the size of the full moon and uh, the neat thing about this comet besides pretty view and so on is the way it was discovered uh, it was discovered by an amateur astronomer. A lot of stuff in, in the uh, temporal things, things that change quickly and are relatively bright, get discovered by amateurs, not by professionals. Uh, but the neat thing about what uh, Rob Matson had done is that he's, he, this is his um, eighth comet, I believe, discovered by not taking pictures of the nighttime sky, not even looking with his eyes at the nighttime sky. He's looking at images that are coming back from a solar telescope, a telescope that stares at the sun 24-7, which is kind of neat. And on this satellite, Soho satellite, there's an instrument called SWAN. That's where the comet gets its name. It's discovered by SWAN, effectively. Um, and what this does, this this uh, instrument is looking at the nighttime sky, but you know from space, and it's mapping out the whole sky roughly once a day in extreme ultraviolet light. And so that extreme ultraviolet light is far shorter wavelength than you get through the Earth's atmosphere. So you can't do this from the ground, and it's able to pick up hydrogen gas that's being heated up by or caused to uh, to glow by sunlight hitting it, and so. By looking at images, and here's what he was looking at. Here's a sequence of, you know, each step is one day in the future, starting at April 1st. And what he saw was this tiny little smudge showing up, which means that there's a little pocket of, on this side. Going, here comes the sequence again. As it comes up over here, you can watch this getting brighter and brighter. And then, you know, he, he realizes where it's going, that this is probably his eighth comet that he's just discovered. So he reports this to the rest of the world. This is great. Everybody gets excited because based on how bright it was getting and then when finally people go look, they can see it for themselves. It is indeed getting bright quite quickly. So this could be a spectacular comet. Okay. Unfortunately, and there's always, you know, comets are sort of, you know, you get what you get. Um, the prospects for how bright it was going to get, that it would be naked eye, uh, looks like it may not make it. So we're going to see and the only way to know for sure is by watching, but um, it's not brightening as quickly as possible. It seems to have stalled. It is just barely visible naked eye, but it's not clear whether it's going to get any brighter. So the neat thing is what we'll talk about this in the next part of, of, of this presentation, but um, it, the only way that we'll really know is by watching. So hopefully you will. And then just finally, up in the news, there's Osiris Rex. And Osiris Rex is a you know it's several years in, in its mission. Um, it's basically orbiting around an asteroid called Asteroid Bennu in, you know, in the asteroid belt, in the inner part of the asteroid belt. And so um, the interesting thing about this asteroid is that we're actually going to bring back a sample. So this mission is driven by NASA for the most part, and Canada is a major player. We're providing the uh, instrument that can actually map out with the laser ranger and mapper to map out the surface in excruciating detail because... Um, this asteroid is rotating, like all asteroids tend to do, and this thing is orbiting around it. What it's doing is it's going to stick out its arm, and it's going to just gently touch the surface, blow some you know, high-pressure gas at it to stir up the dust on the surface and so on, grab the particles and the dust and little pebbles that come up in a canister, and then bring that back to the Earth. Okay? So what it means is that it has to match the orbit exactly, and there's boulders and, and, and uh, crater walls and all sorts of stuff on this on the surface of this asteroid, so if it doesn't do it perfectly and get it exactly the right timing, its arm is going to get broken off. It's just not going to be a good story. So, so it requires an awful lot of, of care to get it right. Well, on April 15th, NASA just passed their very first test to make sure that the dress rehearsal is going to, that the real thing is going to go well by doing a dress rehearsal. So what they ended up doing is that they came slowly exactly along the orbit to match exactly the, the rotation of the asteroid, to be exactly above the place where they have to be. And then slowly drifted down to within 75 meters of the surface, extended the arm as if they were actually going to go grab the stuff, went all through the motions of exactly what they needed to do, and then pulled away. So the whole idea is they went through all the steps that they need except actually touching the surface. And so everything went perfectly. This is great. And so this is the closest it's been since, you know, December 31st when it finally arrived, you know, back in 2018 when it arrived at the asteroid. And so this is looking good. Okay, so... Just to give you an idea of what we're looking at for asteroid Bennu, it's about half a kilometer big, you know, from one side to the other, slowly rotating, um, 
this is great. So four sites were chosen about a year ago using the data from the Canadian mapping system. And so they've chosen the site called Nightingale near the top end of the, of the asteroid, near one of its poles. And they're ready to go on August 25th. So if all goes well, that'll be the first attempt to get, actually grab a sample. They got enough gas that if they don't are not satisfied, they can actually weigh the samples that they, when they actually try to get it on board. Um, if it doesn't get enough or it doesn't seem to have succeeded, it can do this a couple of more times. So once it's finally got it, well, don't hold your breath too long because it's going to be until 2023 before it comes back. So the neat thing, of course, is because we're a major player, we will actually, Canada will actually have sample of this asteroid in our own laboratories to study it for ourselves. Okay, so stay tuned, OSIRIS-REx, the summer uh, coming to a universe near you, coming to us back home. Okay, so that is where I'll sort of end it for the um, up in the news. And we'll talk about well, this if you want to a little bit more in the question and answer. I'd love to hear your opinions about uh, SpaceX and, and the uh, Starlink satellites, as well as these other bits of information. Okay, so... So let's move on to what's up in the sky. So this is the part that I like the most. It's basically talking about what you can actually do for yourself. Stuck at home is not the greatest sort of thing. So trying to think of what you can actually look at in the nighttime sky, well, this is a guide for you guys. Okay, so very first and foremost is Venus. Venus has been around for months and months and months. So it's been up since you know, well before winter, before Christmas, and it's been spectacular up in the western sky it's quickly disappearing. So if you go look for it, if you don't you know, get out there fairly early in the evening, you might not even notice it because it'll get lost in the buildings and the trees close to the horizon. But if you actually look at it carefully, like with a telescope, you'll notice that Venus isn't just a circle. So what's happening is that when you look at it, it's not like seeing the, the full moon. What you're seeing is Venus is slowly taking on the phases of just like the moon. It's getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and it's now in crescent phase. So very soon, Venus is going to be invisible. It's going to be a new Venus when it passes between us and the sun. Okay, So right now, tonight, if it was clear, you went outside, you'd only see about 90% of its surface illuminated of the part that's actually getting sunlight on the other side. You're only seeing you know, the backside, the nighttime side mostly. And that's gonna get less and less. Every day, it's gonna lose another half of a percent until finally June 2nd, it's between us and the sun, passing just above the sun towards the north of, it won't go in front of the sun like it did a few years ago, but ultimately, you're not gonna see it. Well. You know, that's, you know, if you're very skilled, you could, but we're not going to put that challenge out. It's just too dangerous when it's so close to the sun. But after sunset, it's still up for, for a few hours. So I strongly recommend that you give it a try to have a look at Venus. And in fact, if you've got a pair of binoculars and you hold them really, really steady and you focus very carefully on Venus, you might try pointing at a star or something else in the sky that you know is just a point of light. And then without changing your focus, look at Venus. You'll discover that Venus indeed is that little crescent shape. So... Uh, and if you've got a camera and you put it on a tripod, you might be able to also see that. So here, for example, is a photograph that I did just a couple of days ago. Uh, okay, so this is the view at around 950. It's already gotten pretty low. That's the little spot over here in the center of the picture. That's Venus. Okay, so not sure if I can zoom in a little bit. I can try a little bit. Okay, so you can see that it's just, you know, this little spot of light. It's the brightest thing in the sky beyond the sun and the moon right now. So that's easy to recognize that it's there. It's not a airplane or whatever. Um, but if you zoom in a little bit, okay, let's go to the next slide. So this is with my cam same camera. I've just zoomed in on it. This is kind of a nice camera. It's a point and shoot, but it has a 50 power lens on it. So I can zoom right in. And if you look carefully, you'll see that Venus is in fact a tiny crescent. Okay. And this one is a kind of bit overexposed view. So it's not exactly as what it would look like by eye through the, the binoculars. But if I Zoom back out a little bit here and show you, sorry about that. If I zoom in again, same picture, same camera, same tripod, but instead of using 1 25th of a second, and again, these are very normal, low, don't need a high speed camera, the lenses, whatever the lens can give you, 1 25th of a second. If you've used this exposure in any camera, it'll give you a proper exposure of Venus that you could actually see the crescent. But if I take a shorter exposure, you know, 20 times shorter, then what happens is, well, that's it right over there. So not very exciting, but if I zoom in on that, sorry, if I zoom in on that, um, you can see the crescent much more like it actually appeared. Okay, so it's that's more representative of that. In that, and on the night I did this one, it was about 11 percent, 10 and a half percent illuminated. So not much different than it would be tonight or tomorrow night. But if you're going to try this, please do it soon before Venus is gone. Okay. 
Okay, and again, sorry about that. So, so how do you know where to look, what to look for up in the sky and you know, prepare? So this is my sort of entrance to Stellarium. And Stellarium is spectacularly useful software, excellent software, and uh, it'll let you, you know, simulate the nighttime sky any, from anywhere on the Earth. So you can choose your home location or anywhere else you might be going to visit, for example, or travel to on any day of the year and on any date for thousands of years in the past and the future. And that is really, really useful. And it's a very nice simulation. And the best thing about it is it's completely free. So if you're going to put this on your computer and it runs on Macs, Windows or Linux, um, it's free. If you want to put it on your phone and that's, you know, it also works very well. It's a little bit stripped version, but it still works well. Um, you have to pay a few bucks, but for the most part, it's one shot payment and then you're good to go. Okay, so what does this do for you? Well, let's just maybe bring up a Stellarium window. Let me really just bring this up this way. I have to do this slightly more complicated than just simply opening the window. So let's bring up um, Stellarium and put down PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, so there's my Stellarium window. And when it wakes up, it picks, you know, I've got it set for nine o'clock this evening. Okay, so that's on the 17th of May of uh, from you know, it says Toronto, uh, you can set for wherever you want, Richmond Hills, it's up to you. Um, and so this is bright spot. Again, it's a little bit overexposed, it's trying to give you the, the right impression. There'll be a bright star and there's a nice clean horizon here. And I've got it set for a rural setting, so it might not look like your setting. But the key here is that you have to catch Venus early. Nine o'clock is about half an hour after sunset now. Sun goes down about 20 to, to nine right now. So it's just starting to get dark. A few stars in the sky. Capella is over here is one of the, the 10 brightest stars in the sky. So if you can't see anything but Venus, you know, just wait a few minutes and you'll start to see other things. If you catch this early enough, this is something that wasn't in my list of what to look for, but it's a little bit more challenging. Right below Venus, if you've got a clean horizon and you really want to push the, your, your skill set limits here, that little star that's below Venus, about as bright as Capella up above, that's Mercury. And each night, Mercury is going to rise a little bit higher in the sky and then pass by Venus in a few days. As Venus is heading down, each day Venus is getting lower and lower in the sky. And so if you don't sort of catch it, it's going to be gone in just a, in a week from now. Okay, so show you how this works. If I sort of just step forward, so here's Venus now, go to forward. Here's tomorrow, or yeah, tomorrow night, you can see Venus going down, Mercury coming up. Capella also is getting a little bit lower, but also it's getting harder to see. Because as we go into summertime, and then on the 23rd, this is Saturday. Remember, Saturday is, you know, the end of, of uh, uh, Ramadan, and then and then the, the celebrations within the Muslim community. Um, it's anchored to be after the holy month comes to an end. You have to see the the, the new moon again, and the first night you're going to be able to see that is sat is coming up Saturday night, as the moon is up beside Venus, and then Mercury just passing also in the same field of view. Okay, if you got a camera, this is perfect. A 50 millimeter lens would catch that beautifully. All three of them in the same view probably. Don't need a long exposure. You could put it on a tripod though, so you're not hand holding it, so that everything's nice and sharp. And there'll be a whisper thin crescent moon, um, also whisper thin Venus, but of course you're not going to see that in a normal exposure. Okay, so things to look for in the next week or so, leading up to the next weekend. And then what happens with Venus? Keeps getting lower and lower in the sky. The sky is getting brighter at nine o'clock each night because by the time we get to June, you know, the sun is setting at nine o'clock. So you're going to have to observe a little bit later. Okay. And then, of course, Venus won't be visible. Okay. So what else is there in the sky to look for when Venus finally disappears? Well, move to the morning sky, you guys, because that's where Venus is heading to. So let me just change this back to uh, my view of the slide set. Okay. Okay. So in the morning sky, We've got Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn waiting for Venus to come join it. So after Venus disappears in the evening sky and it gets lower and lower and lower, it's going to join Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn in the morning sky. Okay, so Mars itself is still pretty faint because it's pretty far away, but it's it's recognizable as a fairly reddish colored star. You we need a telescope to actually see anything more than just a point of light. Um, Jupiter with a pair of binoculars, you can use that same trick I was recommending for Venus. And you may see a little disk for Jupiter. Jupiter always presents a little disk because it's always beyond, you know, with the sun. Uh, it's always in the distance. We always see it with the sun behind us. So it's fully illuminated or close to fully illuminated. But besides the disk of Jupiter, even if you can't quite see that, 
to see four stars on either side of it. And each night you'll see them arranged differently. Those are the four main moons, four, four large moons around Jupiter. So if you're an early riser, and unfortunately now you're going to have to crawl out of bed at say 4, 4.30 uh, to have a look before it starts to get light. Uh, Jupiter is there. It's the brightest thing in the, in the, uh, the sky right now, in the eastern sky in the morning. Uh, Saturn is not terribly bright, but not very far away. So using Stellarium, you'll be able to find it. And I'll come back to Stellarium maybe to show you where to find them in the morning sky. And then Mars is off to the left and it's going the wrong way. It's until finally it's going to come back to become very bright uh, in October when it actually is closest to the Earth. Okay, so hopefully we'll get spectacular views when it does this. Um, you know, it's as close as it's been uh, for two years ago, it was about the same distance, but it was basically much lower in the sky today or this year it's going to be twice as high so the view should be much better if it doesn't get wiped out the view doesn't get wiped out by global dust storm so um summer happens on the side that we see of mars and what happens is it causes dust to start to pick up and mars is prone to having global dust storms that completely you know block your view of the surface so this is sort of hopefully won't happen this year okay so that's mars Jupiter and Saturn, we still have uh, uh, the Juno spacecraft orbiting around Jupiter on an extended mission. Exciting things that we might talk about in the, in the weeks to come about Jupiter's Juno mission. And Saturn, of course, is always a, a crowd pleaser in terms of really spectacular to look at through even a small telescope. All of those will be, Jupiter and Saturn will be beautifully placed through the later part of the summer in the evening time. So right now they're morning objects, but by late summer, they're up all night long and actually visible right early at the beginning of the night. Okay, so comets. So let's get back to Comet Atlas and Comet Swan. So we did talk about these guys and we're kind of worried about these guys. Um, Atlas, well let's go to Stellarium one more time and just sort of show you where to find that in the, in the morning sky. So this is at nine o'clock. Let's go back to tonight. Okay and actually for tomorrow morning I'm just going to walk through the night. Okay and we're up to the long horizon. This is the western horizon so let's just drag, drag, drag this around and head off towards the southeastern horizon. Okay, And so there's Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars over here. If you can't remember them, you can just turn on the planets. The labels will show up with Stellarium. Stellarium gives you so much support, it's wonderful. And we've got the moon that's on its way to becoming a new moon. Okay, it's not quite there, but it's in the morning sky if you want to have a look for it. Okay, uh, Meteor shower radiant over here. We might talk about that in the weeks to come. Okay, so, so at five o'clock in the morning, not a bad time to go looking for these. Twilight is just starting to kick in, so the view is getting quickly washed out by the glow, advancing glow. Okay, so there's where Mars is. And then where do I look for Comet Swan? Okay, so let's just go a little bit later into it. So this is the 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st, 20th. Moon is now gone to the evening sky. And then Comet Swan, I'm going to go back to four o'clock in the evening. Okay. I'm just going to pull up my comet list. Give you a quick guide in terms of how to use these. I'm going to pull up comets. Huge databases that comes pre-installed. You don't have to worry about all of this. How you find these? Well, we'll figure this out uh, fairly quickly. But uh, there are lots of tutorials on guides, and we can actually support you as well. In terms of finding the stuff out and we'll do for comet swan and it's actually f8 it's the one we want and then over here and this one okay so comet swan is much further to the north of west uh, north of east in the morning and around five o'clock i've got a building in the way unfortunately in this view so i might just change my landscape view and let's just put a pretty bland flat landscape over there so this is nothing to block your view so comet atlas is this little blob of labels all on top of each other because each uh, from the database that's in stellarium it comes you know packaged in and you can grab these things uh, every time a fragment comes off, it gets relabeled and it add, adds to the list of, of objects to look at. So where's Comet Swan? So Comet Swan is coming up into the sky. Let's go back just a little bit in time. 
that's a little bit darker, and that's where Comet Swan is. Okay, so, so 4.30, it's already starting to get a little bit bright. A uh, good time to look at around, you know, go out at 4 o'clock, when it ri roughly when it rises, and then parabinoculars might be able to find Comet Swan. Comet Atlas, you know, again, if I go through time, it's coming down, and right now it's higher in the sky, so if it's clear, say, in a couple of days after the rain that we're going to soon have, so the idea here is that whatever the weather gives you, just be prepared to use whatever opportunities that come. So Comet Atlas is in the same place. Use Stellarium to help you find it. There are finding charts as well online that'll help you find it, but Comet Swan is the one that you want to be looking at because it's the one that still looks, you know, potentially hopeful. Okay, so you notice it rises a little bit. Now we're on the 26th, 27th, 28th, and it comes back down, passing by that bright star Capella that is in the evening sky too. So in fact, if you on the say June 1st, if you look at where it is in the sky, so let's go all the way to the end of the night on June 1st, back to sunset. Indeed, Comet Swan is now up in the evening sky as well as on the in the morning sky, which is kind of neat. And here it just gets higher and higher as it passes Capella, but its brightness is going down. By the time it passes Capella in the evening sky, even though it's getting higher, and this is pretty late. I've got it for 9.30 at night. I can go all the way back to, to, nine, uh, to 10 or 30 at night. I'm going back to 10 o'clock. Okay, so just bring it up a little bit. Sky is just starting to get dark around 10 o'clock. Okay, so parabinoculars again in the evening sky in the beginning of June. So, so these are the kinds of things to look for. And there's Mercury off to the side as Venus again is now gone from the view. Okay, by the June 4th, June, it's already uh, on the other side of the sky. It's already in the morning sky. If I go backwards in time. You see the comet Swan and Mercury and Venus and the Moon are all sort of up in the sky. The end of May, and then the trade off into the evening sky into June. Okay, so certainly go explore with Stellarium. Hopefully, you'll have fun with it, and uh, you can take your questions about that again with the question and answer period. And hopefully, we'll see you back in a few minutes. So, I'm just going to take a slight break. Okay, so I'm back again, and um, some questions I've gotten useful, but maybe, um, I guess first thing is, can you guys still hear me? I just took a quick bathroom break, so I'll make sure you guys can hear me. Okay, let's um, move on. Uh, just um, some questions about how do you actually find these Starlink satellites? Well, that might be something useful. I sort of forgot to mention that. So I'll just quickly bring that up and I'll answer some questions as you guys get rolling with your ideas. So let me just just um, take a tiny bring up the video again. Just so I'll pinch here. I'm just bringing up my Chrome window. There we go. Okay. So one of the first things is make sure you've got the right time. Uh, it's really easy to have your phone and sort of make sure that it's, it's working, but you might want to just basically make sure that you've got your clock sort of synced to what you need it to uh, 
certainly the celerity are probably down there. You hope by one minute they're already packed. I think we are in two minutes or so, uh, three minutes or so left. So um, it's really important to kind of plot your time going with that. So time is, time.is is a great site for that. And then for finding out what's happening from satellite, uh, you might want to go to this website. It's an excellent website called heavens-above.com. And if you just put in your coordinates, you'll have to tell it where you are, but there's a globe that'll pop up just above it. Um, I don't know what map, but there we go. So you can just go scroll down to the map and you can sort of select what you want for uh, location. You can sort of you know, go forward the map and see that something already where I am is shaded as an observatory or proximity. I always think I'm a space out of observatory. Um, but then at the button, you can simply go back to find. Confirm that I really have shared on the screen at the bottom. The uh, important thing here is that you can. Okay. If you go to on the home page, so once you've got your coordinates, you go to the home page and then you can type in what time steps you want. One that's really, really useful is just daily predictions for bright satellites. And that's probably the most useful one. And so it's the third magnitude is about the brightness of a seventh star in the Big Dipper. So that's useful. And uh, you know, you can simply look at Starlink satellites and see how many there are. Um, okay. Okay. Let's see. I'm trying to read here. So I don't seem to be having audio. Please check OBS. Okay. Maybe that's better. Okay, so hopefully that's better for those that are trying to watch my lips are moving and you're not hearing me. So hopefully that's better. I apologize. So uh, our first time through, so that's a bit daunting. Switch board by myself here, but lots of time in the future. So basically, so so I hope that's better. It. Okay, right. Thank you. Okay, so one more time. So sty time is get the exact time. If you're looking for Starlink satellites, you'll need the exact time because they're not going to wait for you. Where to find them in the sky? Heavens above. Heavens are above. Um, the location, so on. And then scrolling down over here, you can see that this whole flotilla is coming through. So this is this is you'd want to be watching. How do you know where it is in the sky? Just click on the time of the first one, the flotilla, and it'll show you the path that it takes you through the sky. This is an all-sky representation, and this will be your guide to sort of figuring out where to look. So this is the northern right above, so below, and the big dip in the center. Full star to guide you through the sky, through the sky, and you simply watch where it goes. So this would be rising in the southern west, rising up, crossing through the till the eastern part of the sky, and then finally coming in the in the north. Um, part of the sky. Okay, so, and if it suddenly disappears, that's when it goes to severe shadow. So you might not see the starlink completely crossing the sky for the rear. So that's how you find the starlink satellites. Uh, almost um, even easier if you just go to another website I like a lot, it's Clear Sky Charts, all one word all glued together, clearskychart.com. In this case, I use you know, your location on the, the map, or you can just type in your uh, GPS coordinates to get to the different sites. But the nice thing about this is you can choose an astronomy oriented time for traveling through every every hour at your location. So it's a very nice little forecast. It uses the current weather models, so it's nothing extra, but it puts it in a way that's very easy to understand. So hey guys, uh, if you're sticking around Tuesday night, so tomorrow night after midnight, uh, it'll clear. And then you've got a nice clear run for several days to make the current forecast because it's so uh, good observing the sky for traveling. So cleardarkskies.com and then just put in your location. You can use a uh, either a map or um, you know, um, uh, but you can also use this as your launch point for that satellite prediction, and it'll take you to heaven, uh, heavens above directly with your coordinates already built in. So it's really, really easy to to navigate through that. Okay. So any other questions? Just checking. 
So, uh, yeah, and the very best place to so the question I've got is, is there a preferred time to do observing in the summer for the planets Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn? Um, you know, for Mars, it's not going to be until fall. Mars is not going to be around for a little bit. It's still in the morning sky, but by the time it finally gets to up all night, that's the beginning of August. So it's going to be a long time, but Jupiter and Saturn are up for most of the, the summer. Uh, they're just probably sticking in around midnight there. Um, in the southern part of the sky, finally, and so, or they're, uh, correction, they're, they're rising, and then by the end of the night, they're in the southern part of the sky now. So uh, if you wait a few more months, they'll, they'll be up all summer, and then that's sort of the best time for them. Um, in summer, of course, it does get dark sometimes late, so that's sort of a, a downside to that. Also, Jupiter and Saturn are, they're not going to get very high in the sky, so they're going to be up bad. Mars will do a little bit better this year than it did years ago, so it'll be twice as high in the sky, so the view would be better, hope, as well, uh, but that's not that to happen. So, um, any other questions? It looks like I have a break up with Galarian if you want one more time or not. Any other questions, you guys? For a time, I always prefer winter because the nights are twice as long as in the summer. So hard to convince anybody else in Canada that that's the best time to observe the sky. Um, it's whatever nature gives you. So, so for example, Neptune and Uranus are up uh, here in the, in the evening, and then so Jupiter and Saturn, because everything is the same. So right now, Jupiter and Saturn are all placed in the summer. For example, 15 years from now, Saturn will be up in the night in the winter time. So because its orbit is 30 years to go around the sun, and so it's going to work its way around the sky, and it'll be in the winter sky 15 years from now. So um, you have to take it as the sun is Mars in October. I wouldn't look that because the next time around, Mars is much further away when it gets close to Jupiter. Every few years or so, it gets closer to the Earth. If you wait to see it um, uh, miss it this October for whatever reason, you don't see it then. Um, yes, you'll see it in similar years after that, but it'll be much less exciting than it was this summer, uh, this winter, or this fall. Okay, so it comes down to that, uh, like the comets, the planets are a little bit more predictable, but again, you know, unless you're living in, oh, you can get on a plane, and now you can't, but get on a plane, fly wherever you'd like, and you've got unlimited money, you can take things or you can take things uh, to wherever they're best to be observed. But um, if you're just stuck in one location, living from, you know, living in Canada, or living in the Richmond Hill, or wherever you happen to be, uh, it really, depends on, on, uh, on the object itself. That'll tell you what's best to observe. Okay, so any last questions? But, uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing you guys back here in the, in the near future. We've got uh, lots of ideas for programs to, to come up. Um, we'll be thinking about the first big part of the observatory in a couple of weeks, so stay tuned for that. I hope that uh, comes to pass. In the meantime, please keep looking at the sky and paying attention. And we'll love to see you back here in the near future. So let me just do one last thing. I'm just bring up a little bit of reminder for you guys. So let me just lock kill Galarium. I didn't bring that one up. I'm just going to go to my last side of PowerPoint. There you go. And so my last reminder for you guys is <laughs> excuse me, I've got a Just remember to keep looking up and paying attention, and hopefully we'll see you back. Well, if not at the observatory, then certainly here online. Very much, you guys.